Good morning. Welcome again to worship at Libertyville Covenant Church. We are so glad that you've joined us this morning from wherever you may be. Uh, We want to encourage you uh, as we continue our worship virtually to uh, continue to use the tools of virtual worship to connect with one another to be part of the worship service. Uh, Today we are going to, as we often do, use the chat bar uh, beside your screen to share not only greetings, as we have been, but also passing of the peace, um, prayer requests, um, answers or discussions during the sermon. That is perfectly fine. Uh, Whatever uh, you may want to bring to the chat bar, bring to the group, would be wonderful. We come to worship differently than we come to a YouTube video. Uh, We come to worship to participate to be a part of the service. And so I want to encourage you. I know things uh, have been going this way for quite some time, and it's easy for us to kind of let down our guard, so to speak. But worship is about coming before the Lord to praise and glorify his name. So I want to encourage you to truly engage with the worship service today. To do that better, I want to encourage you even now to make sure that everybody around you has paper and a writing utensil. We're going to do some journaling at the end of the sermon as we reflect. And if that isn't your particular way of doing it, today I'm going to ask that you try it out. I'm going to ask today that everybody have that available so that we can take some time during the song to reflect on what we've heard. A few quick announcements before we dive in. Immediately following uh, our worship service today, we will have our uh, LCC BYOC coffee hour. Bring your own coffee. Uh, We invite you to join us uh, in Zoom at our uh, church room, which uh, you can enter the room by going to Zoom, clicking on join a meeting, and uh, using our phone number for the room ID, 847-362-3308, is the room ID, no password, and you can join us uh, immediately following the service for a coffee hour, a time to just chat and catch up with friends. Uh, I want to encourage you to consider doing that, even if you haven't before, just to connect once again with your LCC family in a different way. Another way that you can connect with the family is through small groups, Uh, Again, I want to strongly encourage you. I know it's summertime, and a lot of times we uh, kind of take vacations. This year, that's a little different. So I want to encourage you to join one of our LCC small groups. You can go to our website, libcov.org, and there you'll find the sign-up sheet uh, for uh, a way to voice your interest in being part of one of our small groups. Some are virtual. Some are actually able to meet both virtually and in person at this point because we're in phase four. So we want to encourage you to join one of those small groups. There's a lot of different small groups with a lot of different venues and a lot of different ways of doing it. So come and uh, connect with your friends, connect with Jesus, and learn a little bit more about him this summer as we wait. Our most uh, recently started small group is happening Thursday nights at 6.30. Uh, It is our racial righteousness group, and we've been talking and chatting uh, about racial righteousness. We've been sharing our own stories, and we'll continue to as together we read a book and uh, just kind of walk this journey together. Uh, We'll be talking a little bit more about that later on in the service, but want you to be aware of that. And finally, in a few weeks on uh, June or July 26th, uh, we're going to be celebrating a camp Sunday. Most of us can't go to camp this year the way we've wanted, and that's a piece of grief for us. At the same time, we do want to bring a little bit of that camp experience to you during worship. So we're going to have Eric Strom from Covenant Point Bible Camp bringing our message. We're going to have uh, some camp songs. We're going to have opportunities to uh, hear a little bit testimonial-wise about how camp has affected our lives. So join us special on July 26th for Camp Sunday. Today, we've gathered to worship the Lord. Today, we've gathered to uh, follow along in a liturgy. Liturgy, liturgy, originally really means the work of the people. So I want to encourage you to be about doing the work of worship. Today, uh, we're in the midst of a sermon series on God's call to us to go and make disciples and God's call to go to different uh, people and characters throughout Scripture. And today, we're looking at Samuel. Samuel, the the 11-year-old boy who heard God's call and answered. So with that theme in mind, I invite you to hear the words of our call to worship. God is calling. We may be confused or frustrated or simply unsure of what that call may be, but God is calling. So come to worship 
today with ears open to hear God's call and hearts prepared to answer it. Let's pray together. God, our Heavenly Father, you who have called us to join you in mission, this morning we pray that you would speak clearly and loudly so that we might hear and have the choice to answer the call and join you in your mission or not, and the courage to join you whatever may come. Lord God, may our worship bring glory and praise to you today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. It's an age-old tradition in the church of passing the peace. Usually we would shake hands or some traditions even give a holy kiss as they pass the peace of Christ to one another. We obviously aren't doing that, but we are still passing the peace to one another because it's more important now than ever when the world is in turmoil that we wish the peace of Christ for one another. So I invite you to turn to those that you're sitting with, those that are with you now, and also uh, in the chat bar virtually with those with whom you're worshiping, and offer them the peace of Christ with the words, the peace of Christ be with you, and the response, and also with you. Let's pass the peace together.
our minds, help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. important things that we do in worship in any given time is that we pray for each other and we pray with each other. Prayer is the church breathing. And so a church that isn't praying is basically in pretty rough shape. And so we come today uh, to pray together, to pray with each other in community, to pray for one another as community. And so we want to invite you, if you haven't already, to put any prayer requests you might have that you would like us all to pray for in the chat bar, go ahead and just type those in and send them. Uh, We will keep our eyes on that even as we're praying so that we might uh, pray for you and lift up the needs around us. I also want to point you uh, to our bulletin. Our bulletin is uh, found, there's a link at the bottom of the page you're on right now, uh, also on our web page, and you can click and download that bulletin. In that bulletin, you will find a section called People to Pray For. And this is uh, the most current update we have as a church of people in our congregation that are in need of our prayers. I want to encourage you not only to have that available now, but also throughout the week. Put it in a public place, put it someplace that you'll see it, and remember each time you see it to pray for one another throughout your week. For now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you join me? Holy God, You who call us, you who walk with us, you who go before us, and you who follow behind, Lord God, you who are above us but also within us, we come to you in prayer today. Father God, we come as people who are not worthy of your presence. Lord, we recognize in ourselves the things that that we do that go against your will, the things that we have allowed to become habits in our lives that we know break your heart. Lord God, for these sins we confess today. Lord God, we come to you and want to lay those before you not as a means of self-flagellation, not as a means of shame, Lord, but because you've called us to and because none of them are hidden from you anyway. Nothing we share today can be new news to you, can, can uh, inform you of something new. And anything we don't share today, Lord, is not hidden from you. And so, Lord, out of reverence and worship, we lay our sins before you. We confess them to you. As we often say, Lord, we confess the things that we've done as well as the things we've left undone. We confess, Lord, the ways that we have gone against your will actively, putting ourselves and our own needs above you and your mission. The ways that we followed after other gods, be they comfort or money or actual other gods that the world is drawing us toward. Lord God, we confess before you today these sins, but also for the things we've left undone, Lord, for the ways that we have allowed ourselves to be distracted into inaction, for the ways that we've been able to watch as injustice happens around us, 
for the times when we have seen your kingdom and ignored it. All of these things today, Lord, we confess. And Lord God, even more than that, we also repent. In our confession, Lord, we state before you the things we recognize as sinful in our lives, but in repentance, Lord, we turn away from them and back to you. So, Father God, we turn away from the sins in our lives. We turn away from our inactivity. We turn away from not going when you've called us to go. Lord God, we turn away from our selfish desires. We turn away from all of the things that we are doing to try to make us happy and make our will be done. When as your followers, it is all about you. Lord God, thank you that when we confess our sins, you are holy and just and forgive us our sins and cleanse us from that unrighteousness. Lord, may we submit to your cleansing, whatever that may look like in our lives. For Lord, you are the only one who can do that. You're the only one that can cleanse us of that. We can try until we're blue to get rid of our own sin and it just won't work. But Lord, you already have for us. Lord, you have taken our sin as far as the east is from the west and you have gotten rid of it. And for that, we thank you today so very much because you, Lord, are forgiving and graceful. Lord God, you are also all-powerful. You are all-knowing. And you are all-loving. And these days, Lord, it can take an act of faith to believe all three. And yet we do. Lord God, in your power, we lift to you our prayer request today. Lord God, we've seen them in the chat bar, we've seen them in the bulletin, and we know them in our own hearts. So Lord, hear us as we lift our prayers to you today. Let's take a minute or two, just in silence, to lift our prayers to God today. Lord our God, everything that we have comes from you. And so we come asking for these things, not selfishly, Lord, but for one another. And so, Lord, we pray for health and we pray for peace. Lord, we pray for patience. And we pray that you would give us a supernaturally other-focused worldview. Help us to be able to think of each other before ourselves, in our families, in our communities, in our world. Lord God, you are the God who gives, and you have given us so much. So today we come also in thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for all that we have. Thank you for our health. Thank you for our communities. Thank you for our churches. Thank you for our families. But Lord God, also thank you for the ways that COVID has not affected us. Thank you for the ways that the things of this world can't reach us. Lord God, thank you for your protection. Thank you for your healing. And Lord God, thank you more than anything else for the hope that you give of our eternal resurrection and our eternal life for you, with you. Lord God, we thank you. We talk a lot, Lord, and so we pray uh, that you would give us time this week to just listen. As we'll take time later in our service to spend some time listening to you, Lord, we won't do it now, but I pray that even as we are singing and praying and listening and thinking, Lord, that you would be speaking to us and that we would have ears to hear. Speak this day, Lord, and give us the courage to answer. 
Lord, all of these things we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As we acknowledge that everything that we have has been given to us by God, we also have a piece of our theological lives called stewardship, a time when we can give back to God with some of what he's given to us as a gift. And so uh, we want to take some time to encourage you in your stewardship life. We want to encourage you to think today and this week about what are some ways that you can give a little more time to God What are some ways that you can use the gifts and talents he's given you, that you can develop those for him and then use them for him? What are some ways that you can use the treasures that he has given you for him and his ministry? We invite you to support us here at Libertyville Covenant Church through our website, Giving. Uh, If you take a look at our website, in the upper corner, you'll see the word Give. You can just click on that and then scroll through all the options of different ways to give to the ministry of this church. We are doing the best that we can to be faithful to God, and every penny that you give to us goes towards furthering his kingdom here on earth. So we invite you to give. And as we give and as we ponder our stewardship, let's respond together by singing together the doxology. Would you sing with me? Lord God, all that we have is yours and is a gift from you, and so we give it back. Lord God, we give you all that we have. We give you our lives and our time, our families, and our hope. And Lord God, we thank you for all that you've given us. Give us wisdom in how best to further your kingdom here in this place. In your holy name we pray all these things. Amen. As we prepare to hear God's word, let's uh, begin by singing together hymn number 620, Lord Speak to Me. It's uh, verses 1, 2, and 5, if you have a hymnal there at home. And so let's sing together.
Good morning, church family from beautiful Bailey's Harbor, Door County, Wisconsin. Our first scripture reading today is the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling us at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Our second scripture reading today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6 verses 8 through 10. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, Make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. This is the word of the Lord. I'd like to invite you real quickly to grab your Bibles or your Bible app and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3 with me. We're going to actually be expounding a little bit beyond the text that was read today, so you might want to have it in your hands so you can see it and read it and follow along. Back in 1988, uh, I went to CHIC. CHIC is our triennial youth conference, although back then it was every four years. And uh, I went to CHIC and uh, had a wonderful experience. Uh, It's an incredible event. And I came home uh, late that night, and I uh, was with my uh, dad in church. My mom was working. And so dad and I were sitting in church, and I'd been up all night telling them the stories of my experience at CHIC, so I was exhausted. Uh, And so we sat in the warm sanctuary uh, as the pastor had his full black robe and stole on, and the air conditioning must not have been working, I think, because I just remember it was just dripping hot in that room. I, up up until this point in my life, I had really not thought much about ministry. Uh, I had kind of expected to be a math teacher. That had been kind of my goal. I enjoyed math. I'm one of those weirdos that does math for a hobby um, and just really liked it. And then my dad was a teacher, uh, and I had a lot of teachers in my family, so math teaching was where I was heading. As I sat in that worship service that Saturday in the summer of 1988, I sat and I listened to the pastor as he, uh, as he prayed and spoke, and I listened as we sang and, and uh, came to prayer time, and uh, I bowed my head, and uh, everybody else did, and, and I found myself quickly drifting uh, off to sleep, as no one else does in this church, of course, but I did at that point. Uh, so I opened my eyes real quickly and looked up and was like, okay, so I got to keep my eyes open to stay focused. And I was looking at the pastor, and as sweat dripped down his brow, I thought, holy cow, he has got to be so hot in that robe. Now, whether this was the voice of God that spoke next or whether it was just a, a, a sense in my heart, I don't know. But the phrase came to me very clearly in that moment. Well, you better get used to it. 
Not exactly a normal call message from God, but I truly believe and have believed to this day that that was God's message to me, a call to me into ministry. I somehow just knew in that moment that that's what he wanted me to do. I also knew in that moment that I did not want to. So in this, when the service was over, after I'd pondered that and missed the entire sermon because I was thinking about that moment, I was in the car with my dad and we were driving home from church. He noticed that I was pensive and uh, a little bit uh, concerned, and so he turned and said, Steve, what's going on? I, said, I turned to him uh, as he was driving, and I said, Dad, I think I have to be a pastor. And Dad turned to me and looked, and he said, Steve, then you be the best pastor you can be. And the rest of my life's trajectory turned on a dime that day, and I became a pastor, and here I am preaching to you right now. Every one of us is called. Every single one of us is called with varying degrees of the dramatic. We are called generally as God's people to follow in his mission for the kingdom of God, which is to go and make disciples. I'm not sure if you remember because we haven't mentioned it in a number of weeks, but we have a memory verse we're working on together, which is the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, where uh, it's called the Great Commission. Where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's our memory verse. I want to encourage you to keep working on it this summer. Keep working on memorizing that piece because that is our general call as God's people for every one of us. No one who is following Jesus is exempt from that call to go and make disciples. But we are also individually called specifically to accomplish our part of that mission according to our gifts and our faith. Some of us are called to be hairstylists so that we can talk with our clients while we're working on their hair about Jesus. Some of us are called to be uh, in the financial realm, so that we can learn and model and teach people about what it means to be good stewards of all that God has given us. Some of us have been called to be soccer stars or movie stars or famous in one way or another so that we can then go and make disciples within that realm of that world in which God has called us. Every one of us is called to the mission and then called to our specific life within that mission. The mission is not a compartmentalized sidebar to the important thing, which is how I'm going to live my life. It is, in fact, the story of which our little piece of story is a part. Today we're talking about calling. And because every one of us is called, it's important for us to hear what God is doing in the lives of his people in terms of call. So, as we begin, I'd invite you to pray with me uh, and pray for me. Lord God, speak that we may hear. Speak loud enough that we can hear your voice. Speak clear enough that we can understand. And Lord, speak lovingly that we might accept the call and move forward from this day as your missionaries. In your name we pray, amen. In terms of dramatic call stories in Scripture, Samuel's is perhaps one of the most famous, and in my opinion, perhaps one of the best. There's a lot of call stories. In fact, that's kind of what we're talking about this summer. Our theme of go into the world that we're all uh, walking through together uh, involves a lot of different call stories from Abraham and Moses, from Joshua and Gideon that we've spoken about before, Isaiah that we're talking about today a little bit, uh, along with Samuel, and then Ananias and the disciples and and you, and me. But of all those call stories, Samuel's might be the most famous for us. The ancient historian Josephus tells us that Samuel was probably around 11 years old at the time of this event. His mother, Hannah, had been barren, which means she couldn't bear children. And so she cried out to God against the shame of that in her culture as well as just the personal loss. And she cried out to God to give her a child. In return, she prayed, she would dedicate this child to God. She would uh, give the child to God to be a worker in his temple for life. 
Eli, the priest who was there in the temple that day and saw her crying out, she wasn't actually speaking, just moving her lips. He thought she was drunk, and so he condemned her for it. When she explained what had happened, instead, he prayed that God would grant her request. And sure enough, God did. Soon, she bore her son, Samuel. In fulfillment of her promise, Hannah gave Samuel to Eli as a servant and apprentice in the temple. And Samuel served Eli all the days of his life so far. He served Eli in the temple for 11 years. Which means that he was two years shy of adulthood when this story takes place. Because in the Jewish culture of that day, 13 was the transition into adulthood and out of adolescence. Well, Eli, the priest, was old, and he couldn't see very well, and eventually at all, but for now, he couldn't see very well. So he needed Samuel to be with him 24-7, to help him around, to help him with his tasks and chores, and to train him, even in the night. So uh, the temple at that time included rooms for the priests to live in that surrounded what was called the priest's court And Samuel's room was presumably next to Eli's. Eli, being older and blind, commonly needed Samuel in the night. And so it was pretty common for Eli to call out to Samuel to come and help at all hours of the day. But God's call was rare. The text tells us that exactly. The call of God, the word of God, was rare in that day. In fact, any word from God at all was rare. And there weren't many visions. See, this is coming right after the time of the Judges, if you know a little bit of your Old Testament biblical history. And in the Judges, we read again and again and again and again that the people did whatever was right in their own eyes. This kind of defines this period of the Judges. Some of the Judges, like Ehud and Gideon, who we've heard about, and Deborah, they spoke the word of God to their people. Other Judges, like Jephthah, And Samson didn't. And however that may have played out, it had been a very long time since anyone had spoken to the people in God's name. But with Samuel's call, this story today begins a new season of prophetic ministry, of God's word shared with the community. But it was almost not so. This story almost didn't happen. God almost had to choose a different person to be his prophet instead of Samuel in order to accomplish his mission. Now, I want you to think about that concept for a minute. Let's set the story aside. I just want you to think about that for a second. Do this little exercise with me. I want you to think about someone you really admire. I want you to get them locked into your mind. Who is someone that you seriously admire? Someone in your work life or in your church life? your school life, your social life, your family life, or your personal life. Think of one person that you admire more than anyone else. And I want you to think of that name. So I don't want this to be be a general thought, and I don't want you to miss this. So put a name on that person. Now I want you to imagine that that person asks you to be part of a great project that they're working on. It's a new company that they're building or, or a, a, a new composition they're putting together. It's a new ministry that they're beginning or, or they're putting together a new research paper that will revolutionize something. They're going on a new journey and they want you to come with and to help them lead it, be a part of it, put your name on it. What happens if you say no? What happens if you miss their call to join them in that? They don't stop the project. It will continue. However, you will miss out on being part of it and all the blessings that it brings. This is a really important thing for us to remember in our own Christian life. When we don't answer God's call, it does not stop God's plan. However, what it means is that we miss out on getting to work with God. We miss out on being a part of his work and of all the blessings that working with God brings. You see, Samuel, like us, had three things that almost kept him from answering God's call. Do you see them in the text? Some are obvious, some may not be. 
What are those three things? First, Samuel was asleep. Now, for Samuel, this was literal. One of his duties every single night would have been to light a lamp in the temple called the lamp of God. In a land that had no electricity, darkness was prevalent, especially at night. It was pretty pitch black. But the temple needed light 24-7. And so they kept just enough oil in this lamp for it to burn through the night and then go out in the morning as the sun came up and they didn't need it anymore. That way they didn't waste any of their precious oil. We read in the text that the lamp was still lit. So this must have happened for Samuel really early in the morning, just before the oil ran out, just before sunrise. And Samuel was asleep. Although he was probably used to being awakened by Eli, Samuel was asleep when God called. And as we have all experienced with calls in the night or even alarm clocks in the morning, it is really easy for us to just sleep right through. Samuel almost missed the call simply because he was asleep. The second thing, though, is that Samuel almost missed God's call because he misunderheard. Yep, just used that word. He misunderheard. Quick, quick another aside, our five-year-old Isaac uh, has begun to coin terms that he likes to use, and one of his favorites is to misundersee. When we don't understand what he's writing or what he's drawing, he says, no, 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 you've mis- you misunderstood. This is kind of misunderstood, except uh, with misunderstood, it's about thoughts and ideas. With misunderstood, it's about the visuals that we miss. And so I want to use that idea for Samuel. This was about what he heard. And so Samuel misunderheard. Samuel heard God's voice. But he thought it was something else. He thought specifically in this case, it was Eli that was calling him. Eli was always calling in the middle of the night. So when Samuel heard, he heard what he expected to hear, not what he actually had heard. During COVID time, our kids are often up until the wee hours of the morning around our house. And if someone was to have broken into our house during that time, I would probably assume all the creaks and the noises and the things that went on down there were just our kids up that time of night because that's what I've come to expect. We usually turn what we hear into what we expect to hear, just the same way that Samuel did. So Samuel was asleep. And when he did hear, Samuel misunderheard. And finally, Samuel almost missed God's call because he just didn't like what it was God had to say. We didn't quite read far enough in Scripture for this, so let's take a look at what happens next. Turn your Bibles again to uh, 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 3. Once Samuel was finally open to God's call, once Eli finally said, no, 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 this isn't me, it's God, just ask him to tell you what he wants to say, God's message for Samuel and his call to share this message was not very pleasant. Let's read real quickly. The Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin that he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord, but he was afraid to tell Eli the vision. He was afraid of what God had called him to share. But Eli called to him and said, Samuel, my son. And Samuel said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that uh, he said to you? Eli said, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. And Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Wow. That's a response, huh? God's call was for Samuel to tell his mentor, his friend, and even his pseudo-father of God's judgment upon his entire house. Samuel was afraid to share this, but thank God for Eli. Eli pushed for Samuel to be true to his calling, and so he was. 
And I've wondered for years how much this particular interaction on the first go at trying to be God's voice helped Samuel through his entire prophetic career. So these three things uh, are not unique to Samuel because these are the same three things that plague us when it comes to hearing God's call. Have you experienced these things yourself and found them hindering your answer of God's calling in your life? Remember what they are? Number one, I'm asleep. God never forces himself on us and he will never force his calling upon us either. We have to be aware and awake if we are to hear the call of God. Jesus told us in the New Testament that the sheep know his voice. His sheep, the people that he that follow him know his voice. And this is important not just in following, but it's extremely important when it comes to his call to action. This world will work very, very hard to keep us asleep to God's voice. It'll distract us from God with entertainment, cell phones, anxiety, busyness, with addictions and even binges. It will use even seemingly good things to plug our ears to God's voice. So we have got to be diligent in taking time every day to be still before God and listen so that we might know his voice. He won't speak to us every time we do this, but he will speak. And if we aren't taking the time to listen and get to know his voice, we may very well be asleep to his calling when it comes. Number one, I'm asleep. Number two, I misunderheard. God is different than anything that we encounter. He is utterly different than we are, so it's pretty easy to misunderhear him. When God prompts you towards action, what kinds of things might you confuse his voice for? I hear this with people all the time. How do I know that was God's voice? What if it was? What if it wasn't God? It was just my own imagination. What if it wasn't God? It was actually the devil trying to get me to do something else. What if it wasn't God? It was my subconscious or or others' expectations they've put upon me or my own psychology. Again, this is where it's so important for us to know God's voice on a daily basis. We have to do this through practice and through prayer. How is it that we as parents can often hear the cry of our own child in a room full of crying children? It's because we've heard that cry over and over and over again. If you're diligent in taking time every day to be still before God and listen, you will know his voice as opposed to all the others. I'm asleep. I misunderheard. And I don't like this calling. Once we've heard God's call and once we understand what it is, then comes the really hard part, which is submitting to God's will. Submitting to God's will to pack up and move the whole family, even when things are so good and comfortable. To confront that person and begin the road to forgiveness. To take responsibility for my part in a broken relationship and to put the work in to try to mend it to bring a message that is unpopular, even to the power brokers at work or school or in this world who could really seriously make me pay for sending that message. God never asks our opinion about his calling. He only asks for our obedience. Our other scripture today came to us from Isaiah chapter 6. It's another very famous passage of calling. Isaiah has just seen the throne room of God complete with cherubim and seraphim. and He's been cleansed and prepared for the message he has to bring. And then come those famous words we all use regularly. Here am I, Lord, send me. We hear that all the time. But we usually don't keep reading to find out what it is God sent him to do. Let's read and see what happens in Isaiah chapter 6. God said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. This is no promise that God's call will be pleasant or easy or popular. In fact, more than likely, God's call will be just the opposite. 
But I promise you this, and I want you to hear it. To obey God's difficult will is always better than to ignore and live the easy way of the world. Let me close by putting this into a context for us, an easy example. We're talking a lot right now as a church and as well as a culture about racism. Racism is an evil that has plagued our world for simply too long. God's call to us as his people is the call to justice and to righteousness and to unity. From seek first the kingdom of God and his justice to for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, the different races at all. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. From one to the other and everything in between, the Bible is clear that racism is pure evil. So let me ask you the three questions for Samuel. Are you asleep to that call? As a church, we're reading the book White Awake together and discussing it every Thursday night. Personally, Heather and I have been reading the book Waking Up White, and there's a common theme that we see through each one of those, and that's that we have been asleep to God's call for justice in the world, specifically in this area. Number two, are we misunderhearing? Have you decided that this call to justice is political rather than theological? That's a misunderhearing. Have you decided that this call is coming from humans rather than from God? From society rather than from the Bible? If so, you are misunderhearing. And finally, are we ignoring a difficult and painful calling? Working towards racial righteousness is uncomfortable, and it's difficult, and it's angering, and it's scary. But as I said before, following God's difficult call is always better than ignoring it for the easy ways of the world. I'd asked you to have a piece of paper and some, uh, a pencil handy, and now it's time for it. We're going to play a song, uh, and it's not a song we want you to sing along with or even sit and ponder. Uh, I want you to take this time with that song in the background to reflect on this message. I want you to see where this message made you angry or where it made you afraid or where it made you smile. What resonated with you out of this message? And whether you're comfortable or not, I'm going to ask you to write this time. Even if you're not one who likes to write and you'd rather just ponder in your mind, I want you to take your pencil and write. And I want you to answer these three questions. They'll be on the screen as soon as we start singing. Number one, what has resonated with you this morning? Number two, what might God be calling you to? Generally, but also specifically. And number three, how might you be asleep or misunderhearing or too uncomfortable with God's call to answer? All right, we're going to play, and I want you to take some time. Grab that paper. If you want to talk with people around you, you can. But at least grab a piece of paper and write down the answers to those three questions. Washing my eyes to see your majesty. 
at a loss for words and the funny things is okay. Let's take a second and pray over these papers and our reflections on them. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we reflect on Samuel's call to be a prophet, so we also reflect on our own calls from you. So, Father, help us to wake up to all that you're calling us to. Help us to understand and trust your voice when it comes. Help us to have the courage to take on the calling you've set for us, be it simple or difficult or even impossible because nothing is impossible for you. And may we take the time every day to simply listen for your voice, your calling, so that we might answer when it comes in the name of your Son, Jesus, who wakes us up, who explains your mission, and who empowers us to accomplish it through his Holy Spirit. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. As we close our service, I want to encourage you to sing together with me again another song. It's I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. It is a song that uses that Isaiah text of here am I, Lord, send me. Let's sing that song together with all that that phrase entails. Let's sing.
invite you one more time to our BYOC coffee hour happening right now on our Zoom room. Uh, if you go to Zoom and then log into join a meeting and then put in our phone number as a church as your meeting ID, there's no password, and you can join together with a whole bunch of different people from the church to chat, catch up. But also today, I'd like you to talk, if you're willing, about this idea of calling. Where have you experienced it? Where have you heard God's calling? Um, How have you been distracted from it in the past? Uh, Just share some stories about God's calling in your own life. And now, as you head out into your week, go into this world as people called by God to go and make disciples of all nations. Go as people seeking to find out what is the specific call for you in your part in that mission. And go as people loved by God, called by God, and empowered by God to do whatever it is he may call you to do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.